Okay, questions? So what so this what makes a good leaving group the strength of the leaving group and what about the nucleophile? Just like I don't know, like how do I it? Like this just Okay, so all of the SN one reactions are gonna have a nucleophile reacting with a carbon that's attached to a leaving group. And that nucleophile will come in and it will donate its pair of electrons because We'll talk about that's what a nucleophile has that makes it electron rich as a pair of electrons. But we're going to we're going to reduce the pair of electrons to a negative charge. So the nucleophile is going to give its pair of electrons to the carbon. If it stays, the carbon has ten electrons or five bonds. So then the carbon leaving group bond is going to leave, and we're going to end up then substituting the nucleophile, adding it to the carbon and then the leaving group is going to leave as a negative anion. And in between this reaction, which is a one-step, what we call concerted mechanism, you're, the transition state of this reaction, so the high energy species where the bonds are being made and um, broken, is going to have the nucleophile partially bonded to the carbon, partially bonded to the leaving group, and then the remainder of the three groups that were attached to the carbon are going to be basically trigonal planar. So this carbon looks like it's trigonal bipyramidal, and it, it is. The only thing is it's not five bonds because the nucleophile carbon and the, nucleophile and the carbon leaving group bond, these two are partial bonds, so it only, still only has four bonds. And typically the nucleophile, so this is what the trend, so this is what the transition state is. The transition state is the average of the reactants and the products. Kind of like the resonance hybrid is the average between all the resonance structures. And we use the same terminology and the same um, da the same dotted lines and the same partial delta charges that we used in resonance hybrids. So in this case, the nucleophile is minus 1, going to be 0 for its formal charge. That means in the transition state, it's delta minus. The leaving group is going from 0 to minus 1. It's also delta minus. And then there's a partial bond because I'm forming the nucleophile carbon bond, and I'm breaking the carbon leaving group bond. So this is the transition state for this reaction which means as the reactants, they will climb in energy until they reach a peak, and then they will go down to form the products. That peak is what we call the transition state. Okay, now, all the kinetic stuff, all of the reaction coordinate diagram stuff goes back to general chemistry, which might have been a while. So the peak then is the transition state. The distance between the, the reactants and the peak is our activation energy. And the smaller the activation energy, the faster the reaction. Okay. So that's the mechanism of any SN2 reaction. It's going to look like that. So initially, we are going to stick to leaving groups that are halogens. And our nucleophiles can be anything like they could be another halogen, so they could be F minus, they could be Cl minus, they could be Br minus, 
They could be I minus, they could be hydroxide, they could be CN minus, they could even be C triple bond CH minus. These are all examples of the possible nucleophiles that we could have. And then the possible leaving groups are all going to be halogens, like mostly like chlorine, bromine, or iodine. So when we look at leaving group ability, leaving group ability is based only on one thing. I mean, it's the easiest. Because your leaving group ability is based on that leaving group's basicity. But it's inversely related, which means a strong base is a poor leaving group and a weak base is a better leaving group. So it's inversely related. So that's the easy one, as long as you know what, how to rank your bases. These are all examples. These are all examples of nucleophiles, and I'll even I'll even class I'll even clarify that I'll even say these are all examples of what I'm going to consider strong nucleophiles. Now, which one's stronger than the other? Well, that's going to depend on who we're comparing. But those are all examples of strong nucleophiles. So the idea of leaving group ability, that's one thing: basicity inversely related. What makes a strong nucleophile and relative rankings of nucleophiles, there are three different rules for that. Okay. Bless you. And so these are all strong nucleophiles. Why are they all classified as strong nucleophiles? Last night, I know it was late, last night I posted a video on Piazza. It's 45 minutes long. And you're going to see why it's 45 minutes long if I go down this entire road. But if you need to go back and look at it, it's, it's, it'll reiterate some of the same points. We classify, in my, in my world... A nucleophile with a negative charge is considered strong. So as long as a nucleophile has a negative charge, it's going to be considered strong. And my world is a little more simplistic to start with, but that's because I want to kind of avoid all of the, I don't know, the, all of the exceptions that make the rules kind of seem like there are no rules. Right? If you focus on the exception to the rules, then you're like, there are no rules because there's too many exceptions. I remember this having this conversation with the person who was teaching the, the real organic chemistry when I started teaching in Kansas. And he's like, you know, I don't believe any of these SN1, SN2 rules that we talk about. And I said, well, that's because you're focusing on the, it's me, visitor, first time teaching, telling him, well, that's because you're probably focusing on the exceptions and not kind of glossing over those to start with and then introducing them later on. I don't know that he bought that, but that's fine. It was one year in, Can it's one year in middle of Kansas, and then we moved on. But if we focus too much on the exceptions, it makes you doubt the validity of the rules. So I'm just going to say a negatively charged nucleophile is strong. Now, if you're a nucleophile, what does that mean? You're electron rich. What is the source of your electron richness? A pair of electrons, a lone pair of electrons. Because you're going to donate that lone pair of electrons to something that needs it. Right? The chemistry world is totally philanthropic. The electron rich give to the poorest of the electron poor. Electron rich do not give to each other. You can take that to your, some other class and have a debate about society, but chemistry society is purely philanthropic. 
If you're rich, you've got to give to the poorest of the poor, period. And so my nucleophile is going to have a lone pair, and that lone pair, in the case of, let's say, a halogen, halogens have four lone pairs, and they have a negative charge, but the negative charge is a consequence of having eight valence electrons. That halogen is going to donate one of those pairs of electrons to something that's poor, and up here, when a carbon is attached to a leaving group that's a halogen, the carbon is electron poor because it's delta plus. So that's how it's donating electron poor or electron rich to electron poor. Okay. So the nucleophile then that has a negative charge on it will be strong. But that doesn't mean that all nucleophiles have to have a negative charge. You can have a water molecule that has an oxygen with two lone pairs. That oxygen could donate pairs of electrons. So it's neutral. We're going to consider this to be a weak nucleophile. And this year, anytime we do something with HOH, water, we can do pretty much the same thing with ROH being an alcohol. So the water and the alcohols are going to be our examples of weak nucleophiles because they are neutral, they have no negative charge. So the first classification of is this a strong nucleophile or not depends on does it have a negative charge or is it neutral. Our two neutral examples are going to be water and alcohol, and so they are weak. So that's our first cut at what's strong, what's weak. For nucleophile strength, negative charge strong, neutral weak. Then it depends on what you're comparing. So if we have on our periodic table a CNOF and then CLBR and I on our abbreviated periodic table, the question is, are the two things I'm comparing related horizontally on the periodic table or are they related vertically? And so horizontally, when you have a horizontal relationship, it's totally based on basicity. So basicity is directly proportional to nucleophilicity, which is how strong you are as a nucleophile. So the stronger the base, the stronger the nucleophile. And that's going to come back. We're going to have to deal with that later because I will say numerous times, remember, this is a strong base, but that makes it a strong nucleophile as well. Or this is a strong nucleophile, but it's also then a strong base. And that doesn't all have to be the case. Anything that's a strong base will automatically be a strong nucleophile. Just because it's a strong nucleophile doesn't mean it'll be a strong base. Those two are not exactly the same. Okay. So when you have something horizontal, um, it's totally based on basicity. So here would be my question. Here's two bases from general chemistry. OH minus and F minus. Which one of those two is a stronger base? OH minus, F minus, or general chem was a long time ago, I don't remember. And the only reason I'm asking that is because if every because if I get a high percentage of don't know, then that means I need to go there. In terms of explanations. Okay, let me clear out the responses from this morning. So those are your choices. Ready?
Okay. All right, whoa. I've got nine A's, seven B's, and eight C's. We could discuss, but I don't know what you would discuss if it's been a while from general chemistry. So what we should probably do here to start with is we should probably talk about basicity trends. So let's do that. And by discuss, we mean me talk. Then you ask questions if, when you have them. All right. Um, we can get basicity, whether something's a strong or weak base, based on the strength of the acid. Right? If I have something like HCl and I react it with water, I'm going to get Cl minus plus H3O plus. Right? That's going to be my reaction. Now, the question is, what kind of arrow should go between the water and the chloride? Should it be 100% arrow in one direction, or should I put a second arrow here indicating that it's equilibrium? Which one should it be? Okay, let me ask another question. Is HCl a strong acid, or is HCl a weak acid? Strong. What does it mean to be strong? It means you completely dissociate. So we know the answer to that question. It's a single arrow. So because HCl is strong, a strong acid completely, completely dissociates, which isn't quite true, but we'll work with it for the moment. So it completely dissociates. So this is considered a strong acid. Because that's the definition. What would a weak acid be? If it doesn't completely dissociate, what is it partially? Oh, cat's out of the bag now. It's partially dissociates. Right? Weak partially dissociates. And what does that mean? That means the arrow that should go there is an equilibrium arrow. So HF, for instance, is one of those acids that partially dissociates in water to give me H3O plus and F minus. So that is a weak acid because it partially dissociates. And if you go back in your general chemistry memory bank, you will remember doing lots of ice charts, right? The groan means you already remember those. And so the ice charts were always done with something that was weak, that was in equilibrium. And HF is one of those acids that you did ice charts with. But our question is not so much the strength of the acid. Our question is, what's the strength of the corresponding or conjugate base? So when I take, and the, and the way I have to do this is, I now have to take my base, my Cl minus, and react it with alcohol, or with water, and I'm going to get HCl plus hydroxide, and I'm going to take my F minus, and I'm going to react it with H2O, and I'm going to get HF and hydroxide. So the question is, for chloride and fluoride, what kind of bases are they? Okay. And so chloride is the conjugate base of the strong acid HCl. What kind of base is chloride? What's causing you to be hesitant about that? I 
Never mind. <laughs> Are you sure? <coughs> I mean, we're not gonna we're not gonna you know, humiliate you. True. Will the Cl minus react with water to make hydroxide? If I go grab a whole bunch of sodium chloride and I throw it in water, does the solution become basic? become salty, but it doesn't really become basic. Why? It all depends, see this, the, in my world again, what I like to do is define the conjugate base of a strong acid as a non-base. So I would classify chloride as being a non-base. Why? Because it doesn't react with water. It is not a base. It's not going to form any hydroxide. Right? So the conjugate acid of a strong, or conjugate base of a strong acid doesn't act as a base. It's a non-base. That goes against English. Because the opposite of strong is weak. But what does weak mean? Weak means there'd be an equilibrium there. There's no equilibrium there. So what we should probably be saying is chloride isn't a base. So when you have 100% dissociation, the base strength of the, of the conjugate base is negligible or nothing. It's not. On the other hand, what's F minus? Well, F minus is going to react with water to form some HF and O minus. But that's going to be an equilibrium, so the conjugate base of a weak acid is a weak base, right? And this totally goes against, like I said, it goes against English. The conjugate of weak is weak because they're both involved in an equilibrium. That's what weak means, that you have partial, which means you set up an equilibrium. So that's the difficulty. That's why I, I'm, I'm assuming that's why you were like, never mind. Because at some point you were like, wait, the opposite of strong is weak, but weak doesn't mean the same thing now that you defined it as it did when I wanted to say weak to begin with. Right. And even if that wasn't the case, that sounds good. Right. So weak... Acids have weak conjugate bases. Strong acids have, they don't have conjugate bases. Their conjugate base is not basic. And a strong base has an acid that is not really an acid. It's not, it's kind of a non-acid. So if we use that kind of definition for this, if I went back and I asked, if I go back and ask that question again, who's stronger as a base, hydroxide or fluoride? Hydroxide, what would we consider hydroxide to be? I kind of consider it to be stronger. Fluoride, it's going to be in that equilibrium, so it's going to be weak. So hydroxide is going to be a stronger base than fluoride is. So hydroxide is going to be a stronger base, which means that it's, since hydroxide and fluoride are horizontally related, hydroxide is going to be a stronger nucleophile than F-. The problem with acid-base stuff is that it's something that we have to kind of learn because it's somewhat practical. 
And in the lab, you never like mix things in and measure the pH to determine like whether it's stronger or weaker. And now we're in organic chemistry, which means that water is not our primary solvent. So the pKa scale and the pH scale go out the window because they are only for water. And if I do things in hexanes as my solvent because my organic stuff doesn't dissolve in water, my pKa scale is totally messed up. Like my pH scale would probably go to 45. But we're not gonna, I'm not gonna go down that road. But the pH scales change when you go to different solvents. So hydroxide is stronger base, which means up here on the periodic table, that trend is as you go from F minus to O minus to N minus to C minus, you're going to increase in basicity. So an F minus is a much weaker base than a C minus. C minus is as strong as we get. That's going to be as strong as we get. Then N, mo then N minus, then O minus, then F minus. So if you wanted to draw another arrow, you could draw an arrow from left to right saying that's increasing acidity. So an HF is a stronger acid than a CH bond. Okay. So horizontally then, on our periodic table, that's the trend. And you always have the periodic table, so if you remember these trends, it'll help you remember the basicity or the acidity or whichever one you want to think of. Okay. So if you're comparing two things that are horizontal, it's based, nucleophilicity is based on basis. <laughs> so there you go. O, OH minus would be stronger than F minus. And N minus would be stronger than both of those, and C minus would be stronger than all of those. And we'll, we'll as we do more N minus and C minuses towards the end of the semester and into next, you'll become more comfortable with those. Okay, so horizontally, basicity is the big factor for nucleophilicity. Okay, that's two rules so far. Negative, strong, neutral, weak. Horizontal, basicity determines nucleophilicity. Third and last rule, what about vertical relationships? F minus, CL minus, BR minus, I minus. Who is the strongest nucleophile here in this series? I. So I is the strongest is the strongest nucleophile. That was determined experimentally. So when people determined that that was the trend experimentally, you know, they were like, well, wait, hold on. When you're horizontal, it's based on basicity, but now when I go vertical, it's not based on basicity. As a matter of fact, it's the inverse of basicity, right? Because I minus is a weaker base than F minus is. Or maybe I need to establish that fact. If I'm looking at my acids, HF, HCl, HBr, and HF and HI, I know that HF is a weaker base than all of them because I know HCl, HBr, and HI are all strong from general chemistry, but HF was in all those ice problems, so it's weak because it's involved in equilibria. So going down the periodic table, acidity increases. And so therefore conjugate basicity decreases.
And then you might say, well, wait. If HCl, HBr, and HI completely dissociate, then how, are the, how is HI stronger than HCl? Is 100% dissociation better than 100% dissociation? So if they all dissociate 100%, how can one be stronger than the other? Well, general chemistry has some topics in it that aren't quite presented truthfully. Or maybe they're just presented with a little bit of fudge in them. The idea of complete dissociation is not completely correct. HCl doesn't completely dissociate. You, there's a measurable part that doesn't dissociate. And there's a measurable part with HBr, and there's a measurable part with HC, HI. So if you get into the weeds, you will actually see that HI does dissociate more, a little bit more than HCl does. So they don't completely dissociate. And so HI is a stronger acid than HCl because it, because it completely dissociates more, if that makes sense. So that would make I minus allegedly the weakest base, although none of those are acting as bases, right? Because we're saying they're completely dissociated. They're not reacting with water. So I got a trend that doesn't match the horizontal trend. So then if then somebody, that, that never answers any problems. So then somebody's like, well, why? What's, it, what's in effect here? And so then they de decided to define this term called polarizability. And so they said, oh, well, I minus is more polarizable than F minus. And so when you go down the periodic table, as the polarizability increases, the nucleophilicity increases. So vertically, nucleophilicity, nucleophile strength is based on polarizability. And then you're like, well, what is polarizability? And polarizability is what I then call squishiness, which isn't helpful because it's like, well, what's squishy? And so what we have to do is, as we look at the going down the periodic table, what's happening to an element? As we go down the periodic table, the principal quantum number, the shell number, or the row number, is increasing. And what does that mean? That means the valence electrons are getting farther and farther away from the nucleus. And those valence electrons getting farther away from the nucleus means that they are less tightly held. So nucleophile, a nucleus, electron, valence electrons. In between there, we have lots of other electrons which yield the shielding effects. So the electrophile, or the, ele the electrons, the valence electrons are not being held as tightly. What does that mean? Well, if they're not held as tightly, that means I can deform the electron clouds and I can create pockets of higher electron density. If my ion is large, I can create more electron density with my squishiness. Which doesn't tell me why it's a better nucleophile. Right? Okay, it's squishy. I can form a higher level, I can form higher electron densities, but so what? How does that affect the rate of an SN reaction? This is why the video got to be 45 minutes. 
because it's not a straight line. Although we're almost, we're almost done. My nucleophile's lone pair of electrons basically is going to be in an electron cloud. They're going to be in an orbital. They're going to be in an orbital, and so if I do an SN2 reaction, I'm going to have my carbon. It's also going to be basically bonded to my leaving group by an sp3, probably sp3 orbital overlap, that sigma bond. And when we talked about sp3 hybrid orbitals, we had that big lobe of electron density, and then there was this little teeny tiny lobe that we said that little teeny tiny toe lobe is there, but you know what? We'll come back to it when we need it. We need it. This is a place where we need it. So on the other side of the carbon is the little teeny tiny lobe that goes with the big sp3 hybrid or orbital that is bonding the leaving group. SN2 reactions go by backside attack. And this is the reason why they go from backside attack. It's because now this nucleophile is going to come in and it's going to overlap its orbital with that little teeny tiny lobe as it goes to the transition state, which is trigonal bipyramidal. And then as the, nucleof as the leaving group leaves, though that little tiny lobe and the orbital overlap become bigger and that becomes the primary bond. So... I can form a more stable bond here in the transition state if I can concentrate my electron density into the nucleophile's orbital. <coughs> so the more electron density I can put in this orbital, the stronger that bond is going to become. Now what does that mean? That means that in my reaction coordinate diagram here, that means that I'm going to have a lower, I'm going to have a lower transition state energy. I'm going to have a more stable transition state if I can put more electron density into the nucleophile. And if I have a lower energy, then I'm going to have a lower activation energy and the reaction is going to occur faster. So the nucleophile then having the ability to create more electron density in its orbital is going to create a more stable transition state, which is going to lower the activation energy, which is going to make the reaction go faster. And all of this had to be discovered, um, made up, whatever you want, to explain the fact that iodine reacts faster than fluoride. And it's not based on basicity. So that's what polarizability is. So iodine being at the bottom of the periodic table is large, has lots of valence, elect has valence electrons far away from the nucleus, and is whatever kind of squishiness you want to think about. If we still have Nerf balls, that those are squishy. Stress balls, those little balls with the little tentacles that come out of them, they're all squishy. The ones with the little tentacles that come out of them, when I first started teaching, there was a student who sat in the first row. Apparently, she was under a lot of stress because she needed two of them when she was taking an exam. Now, how she squeezed two stress balls and wrote the exam, I don't know, but she didn't. But they were squishy. So... Fluorine, golf ball, not squishy. So that's how we explain the two trends, horizontal, basicity, vertical, polarizable. And so that's, the biggest part of that is understanding the basicity trends. But vertically, it is not based on basicity, it is based on the size and polarizability. So that was kind of the summary of what makes a good good leaving group is a piece of cake, as long as you understand the basicities, which hopefully now you do in terms of the trends on the periodic table, 
and the trends up and down. But this leads to a paradox. I minus was the best of the halogens. I minus was the best nucleophile. But I minus is also the best leaving group. And so what does that mean? That means if you try and take a bromide and you react it with an alkyl iodide, That's great from the left to right perspective because you're kicking off the iodide. It's not so great from the right to left perspective because now iodine's a better nucleophile, and so it's going to come back in and kick off the, br the bromine. So what you end up with with iodine, there's many reasons to not do reactions with alkyl iodides. Um, one of them is the fact that they tend to do equilibrium reactions simply because iodine is the best nucleophile, but it's also the best leaf. So we usually do everything else. And we're going to deal with halogens as leaving groups right at the moment. <coughs> Unfortunately, the book has decided to foreshadow in problem 7.15, 715, it had a molecule where the carbon was attached to an O, attached to an S double bond O, double bond O, with an R group. And it turns out that this group is an even better leaving group than any of the halogens. And so the reason must be that it's a pretty, that when it comes off, if it's a good leaving group, that means it must be a really weak base. That's what it means. If it's a really weak base, why is it a really, really weak base? Nobody can take the bait on that one. that we'll make it a rhetorical question, which means I'll answer it. So why is this a really weak base? Tell me something about this molecule that you notice. What could I do with this molecule? Nothing. Come back to it. Here's my generic acid equilibrium. HA dissociates into H plus and A minus. We will all agree that the more HA dissociates, the more H3, H plus is formed, the stronger the acid. So I'm going to make HA a stronger acid by making it dissociate more making it push the equilibrium to the right. That will make it a stronger acid. So how do I push that equilibrium to the right? What can I do? I could remove the H plus that would push the equilibrium to the right, but this is an intrinsic acid base equilibrium, so I'm really not allowed to do that. I could add more HA, but the percentage wise isn't going to change. If I add more HA, yes, I'm going to get more H plus and A minus, but I'm also going to have more HA. So I'm not going to increase the, the percentage of HA. Or H, sorry, I'm not going to increase the percentage of A plus relative to HA. Both of those are using, would be Le Chatelier's principle. But Le Chatelier's principle doesn't work here. Le Chatelier's principle only works when you have two things, so removing the H plus will work. 
it's just not going to lead to an, an, an the acidity going on. Okay, so then one of the, one of the ways I can push this equilibrium to the right <coughs> is by making the conjugate base more stable. <coughs> That's not a concentration effect. So if I make a a minus more stable, that's going to push the equilibrium to the right. And make HA stronger. So that's a generic approach that we can use to make an equilibrium shift without using Le Chatelier is to either make the acid more unstable, which we'll do in the future, but we're going to make the conjugate base more stable. <coughs> okay? So that will push the equilibrium to the right, make a stronger acid, make a weaker base. Because, I mean, in chemistry we have the stability reactivity principle, right? The more unstable you are, the more reactive you are. Or conversely, the more stable you are, the less reactive you are. In chemistry, and sometimes with people, that principle holds. Right? Again, people, third floor. You can talk about that up there. But in chemistry, more stable, less reactive. So that's going to make the conjugate base weaker. So now we're all the way back to the beginning here. That's more stable. Why? That's a stable anion. Why? What can I do with that that makes it more stable? Discuss for a minute. Why is it stable? Okay, we have an answer. Does somebody have an answer they would like to share? I swear, if we went through a minute of discussing and nobody has any answers they want to share, that wasn't a productive minute. And then I have to resort to something that I'm not supposed to do. Something that apparently is pedagogically questionable, if I can do it. Well, wait, wrong program. Uh, everybody's name is on a stick. <laughs> so when I push the button down here with the ha nuts, with the happy face, it is going to randomly pull a stick. <coughs> Hannah, is, that, is your hand up? Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's 
front hand on that. Okay. Well, we were just saying that maybe because like it has like thick like total bonds like all the way around, that it was more stable for that reason. Could true. I mean that's that's true. It could be stable there, but I'm looking for what. <coughs> What can you do with this? Is this the only possible Lewis dot structure for this molecule? No. Because what can I write? I can write resonance structures for this. And all the way back at the beginning of the semester, which wasn't that long ago, the more resonance structures you can write, the more stable the molecule is. And so I could take this pair of electrons and move here, and then move that pair of electrons out to the oxygen. So there's two more resonance structures I can draw <coughs> that's going to make that stable. So when they put this leaving group in, this is actually a better leaving group than a halogen because it's a weaker base. I know, how can it be a weaker base than something that's a non-base like a halogen? It is. And this is also the reason why, if you think about H2SO4, when you take H2SO4 and make HSO4 minus, that is a very weak base because it is a very stable anion for this exact reason. All the resonance structures I can draw. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of, and, and if none of this, and if that, you didn't catch some of that, <coughs> it is on Piazza. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, the graded problems for Monday are just the multiple choice problems on the last page of the packet I gave you on, mon on Monday, 1 through 31. The problems that come before that are practice problems. They are not graded. If you have any questions, send me an email, put it on Piazza. I will be caught up on Piazza by the end of the day. <coughs> but you can ask questions over the weekend, etc. And then we'll pick back up here on Monday.